Let's stand for the read of God's Word, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Jesus Christ is speaking to the Pharisees and also you and I. He says, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasures of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of, the, out of evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous Sinful generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. For the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. I want to use for a subject this morning I cross my heart and hope to die. You may be seated. I cross my heart and hope to die. That is a saying way back in the, early, the late 19th century. The first recording of it was in 1857. And I don't know whether anybody in this room has ever said, trying to get a point across that you're telling the truth, I cross my heart and hope to die. The children added, may a needle be put, a needle be put in my eye. There's a little phrase that goes something like this, cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Wait a moment, wait a minute, I spoke a lie. I never really wanted to die, but if I may and I, if I might, my heart is open for tonight. Cross my heart and hope to die, so stick a needle in my eye. If what I say should be a lie, my word is as good as gold. It shall not tarnish or grow old. It has not been bought or ever sold. Basically what that phrase is saying is, if I'm not truthful, then God strike me dead. But I believe that's a little, little radical, wouldn't you say? Amen. That's just a little bit radical. If I'm not truthful, may God strike me dead. I mean, no, God's not in the striking dead business. He, 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 Jesus Christ went to the cross and died, and he was dead so that you and I don't have to be stricken dead. Isn't that good? He, he's alive. He died. He's alive so that you and I can live forever. Um. This is an interesting thought, and I want to begin by saying uh, Jesus Christ is speaking to the Pharisees, and of course, you know, the Pharisees pretty much blasphemed the Holy Ghost. They accused the spirit that was in Jesus as being a demonic spirit, which is a place of blasphemy. And we closed our message last Sunday morning on uh, the fact that if you're interested in God, if you're seeking God, if you're desiring God, if you've been born again, if you haven't been born again, yet you're interested in the things of God, that is entire, dogmatic, 
infallible proof that you have never blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Someone who blasphemed the Holy Ghost says no to the conviction of God until they die. And after that happens, there is no forgiveness for their sin. I'm glad that Jesus Christ forgives all sins. A word spoken against him, he'll forgive. A word spoken against the Father, he'll forgive. But if you reject the conviction of the Holy Ghost and you refuse to get saved, there is no forgiveness after the graveyard, after you die. And so Jesus Christ is telling these uh, Pharisees um, in verse 33, make the tree good. And he, and he begins to talk about a good tree brings forth good fruit, but else, else the tree is corrupt and his fruit is corrupted for the tree is known by his fruit. Now, I want to begin by simply saying that uh, encouraging you today to let us replant our tree. Let us replant our tree. Now see, the Pharisees did not want to replant their tree. They had their way of living, they had their way of doing, and they did not want to change. And so they refused at being an evil tree producing evil fruit. They, and how many know you can still go to church and have evil fruit? You can, you can claim you're a child of God and still have evil fruit. In fact, you can claim that you're going to heaven and you love Jesus and your fruit can be rotten on the limbs. Amen. By the way, let me explain something to you. Fruit always hangs on the outside of the tree. So you're not hiding a thing. Fruit always hangs on the outside of the tree. It comes out of the mouth. It, it's spoken. Jesus Christ said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So let's talk about uh, replanting our tree. Now, someone would say, well, preacher, I'm happy with my tree. I don't think I need to re replant my tree. But I want you to understand, sometimes God will allow us to be uprooted. God sometimes will uproot our life. And when he uproots our life, then there needs to be a replanting of your tree. We don't like to be uprooted. But sometimes when we get our roots in the wrong soil, and we get our roots in the, entangled with the wrong roots of other people, Sometimes we, when we get our roots down in the sewage of the world, we may be a Christian, but our fruit's not going to taste real good because it's sucking from the sewage of the earth, the sewage of the world. And so God has to pull us up, and we have to replant ourselves in the church, replant ourselves in the Word of God, replant ourselves in the things of God, Sometimes we just have to replant, replant our tree. Are oh, you listening to me? And some, you don't, some of you in this room don't need to replant your roots in another church. You need to replant your roots in this church because they're not deep enough. When your roots are deep, you don't have to wither for water. When your roots are deep, you don't have to, your leaves don't have to wither because you're planted by the river of God. When you're planted deep, you don't have to worry about the storms blowing you over. When you're planted deep in this word, you're planted deep in God's love, you're planted deep in your conviction, your commitment to God, you don't have to worry because you're solid and your roots have went down to the solid rock, Jesus Christ, and the river of God flows through the root system of your life. And we need to understand that sometimes when that gets out of whack, God sometimes allows our roots to be uprooted. Once roots are uprooted, we've got to get them back in the ground immediately. If you don't get the roots back in the ground immediately, the tree will die. And so I want you to understand that I'm not telling you you've got to be uprooted from your family. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that you've got to be uprooted from those you love. That's not what I'm saying at all. But you do, at times, need to be uprooted from those things that distract you from God. 
You need to be uprooted from those things that poison your mind. You need to be uprooted from those things that would hinder your life. And that's what Jesus Christ is saying to these Pharisees. You need to, you need to replant your tree. You need to examine yourself because he says to them, either make the tree good and his fruit, or else the tree will be corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. So it, we need to understand that if our life's not going the way it ought to go, if we feel like we're not going where we ought to be going, it's because your root system's not in the right place. Amen? I didn't say your limbs. I didn't say your tree trunk. I'm saying your that which you suck nourishment from, that which you receive energy from, that which you receive life from, that has to be very important, and it is all important in our life. You can't, you can't suck strychnine out of the ground and expect to live. You can't begin to bring things into your life. You know, you got to have a good heart. Jesus Christ said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you've got to have a good heart. Amen? You say, well, preacher, how do I have a good heart? Well, you have a heart transplant. God removes the stony heart, puts a heart of flesh inside of you. You're born again. God gives you a brand new heart. How do you keep that heart healthy? You watch what you hear. You watch what you speak. You watch what you see, amen? You watch what goes in your mind. You watch, you, you watch what, you know, you, there's people that get angry and they say, I gave him a piece of my mind. Well, you better not. You don't have much to give away, amen? Fill your heart with good things. Fill your mind with good things. Fill your ears with good things. Fill your mouth with good things. You say, well, how do I fill my mouth with good things? Are you talking about fried chicken and, and spinach and biscuits and gravy and, and candy and, and, and uh, German chocolate cake and, and you know, uh, banana pudding and fresh banana pudding? And man, the sermon's going to shorten now. How, how we feed our heart is through the words that we speak. And we feed each other's heart by the words that we speak. When you speak to someone in bitterness or angry, the Bible says that we'll give a, uh, an account for every idle word. The Bible says by your words you're justified, by your words you're condemned. And so with our words we can excite people. With our words, we can ignite people and stir people and encourage people and lift people up. With our words, we can tell people that God loves them and God cares for them and, and, and it makes no difference whether you've tripped and stumbled. Our God, a new day, every day is a new day with our God. You can understand that the, there's never been a storm so big that it doesn't blow out. We can use our words to encourage each other or we can use our words to criticize each other. So when we use our words to encourage each other, we nurture our heart. We feed our heart with good things, with our mouth. But if we feed our other people with negativism, and they, I mean, no, when you are negative with someone, they go right back at you. Uh, you know, we're not all real angels. Shoot, none of us are angels. And if it wasn't for the God blocker, we'd be in serious trouble. Amen? So we need to understand that our words are very important to us. When you get up in the morning, don't go to the bathroom, look in the mirror and say, ew, you look ugly. Now, it may be true, but don't say it. Hello? Oh, I'll never go out of the house with some makeup, without makeup on. Well, hey, I'm not against makeup. A little paint helps the old barn. For God's sakes, put it on. <laughs> Judy tells me I need to shave. My, my beard gets to, and I don't have a beard, but I, I'll have one by 6 o'clock tonight. 
I grow whiskers fast. And Judy says, get in there and get that cleaned up. Amen. I say, yes, ma'am. I'm telling her she's a mean woman. If it wasn't for her, I would look like Joshua did last night with all the hair and stuff he was wearing in the, in the get-together. If it wasn't for her, I'd look like something that came out of the cave, the caveman. But we need to spend every day trying to encourage others, and we need to speak good things to each other and speak good things to yourself. Don't go around all day long like Igor. Oh, woe is me. I'm probably not going to make it today. Don't do that. Amen? Even if you don't feel like it, act like you love the Lord. Act like you serve God. Because down in your heart, you really do. See, only a good heart can discipline you to do right when you feel bad. Only a good heart can discipline, only a good tree can discipline its root system to produce what it is, a peach tree peaches. Amen? Hello? I've never walked out to a peach tree and picked an apple. I never have. Amen? And we need to understand that that we need to feed our mind. That means watch what you think about. That means watch what you... Be careful about the music you listen to. Be careful about the... the I don't think people watch TV anymore. Does anybody ever watch TV anymore? And sometimes I'll turn on the cowboy channel, you know, the Western channel. If I ever want Judy to stop, I'll just turn on the Western channel. Because Judy's always busy. But if I turn on the Western channel, she'll walk through the living room, she'll go. And it isn't long, she'll be sitting. <laughs> that definitely captures her. <laughs> Amen. I, I can go buy two dozen cookies and put them on the table. And Judy will say, why do you do that to me? And then long, I'll go back, and the box is pretty empty. Because I'm telling you, I'm married to the cookie monster. <laughs> she loves cookies. My favorite candy is circus peanuts. When I traveled across the U.S. in revival meetings, I'd stop and get them circus peanuts that, you know, have, have the air and they're real soft. And that, man, I love them. I'd get in the van and five, five of the kids at that time were uh, born and riding in evangelism. And they'd look at that circus peanuts and I'd get in the, get in the van and they'd go, ew, those things are awful. And I'd open it. Somebody would grab it, I'd reach for it, and the bag would be empty. I hate to think what would have happened if they loved it. Now, let me encourage you, if you are not what you want to be in the Lord, if you're not there, you need to replant your tree. You need to refill your heart. You need to fill your mind with good things. Fill your heart with good things. Fill your ears with good things and begin to say good things. Begin to, begin to share good word with people. Begin to minister to people in a good way. Because so many times we say things that are hard, that are vile, and we say things that are really a lie. And verse 35 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, but an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. And that's why I called the sermon, Cross My Heart and Hope to Die. That is, if I lie. We need to be careful what we say. 
most sins are committed by us by our mouth. Most sins are created or committed through our mouth. But it's done that way. It happens that way because our heart gets away from God's best. Our heart gets away from prayer. Our heart gets away from the preaching of God's Word. Our heart gets away from the Word of God. Our heart gets distracted. And then we find ourselves needing to be replanted. We need to replant the tree. Make the tree good. Amen? I guess what I'm saying to everybody in this room, let's make it good. Let's make today good. Let's make the tree good. It's not easy to uproot something in your life and then replant it. But understand, if God has uprooted you in your life, or for some reason you've been uprooted in your, in your thinking, in your walk with God, just be diligent to get the roots down into the Word of God. Get the roots down into the things of God. Get the roots in a, down deep into a, a, a wonderful church where we teach the Word verse by verse and we grow in the things of God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in that day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Let me tell you, friends, no one has to be condemned. You, some people say, well, I've got to give an account for every idle word. Yes, what you say matters. What you say matters. What you believe matters. What you love matters. What you do matters. As a Christian, what you say matters. But understand this. When Jesus Christ said, for every idle word you'll be Give account, you give an account of. Understand, he was speaking to the Pharisees. They were rebuking him. They were criticizing him. They were lying about him. And so he's telling them, you be careful, because every idle word you say will rise up against you, and you'll be judged. I'm glad that Jesus Christ can knock them words that I say sometimes down like a flash water with a blowfly. Amen? Amen? I love it. Sometimes when I start speaking, God has to get his Holy Ghost flash water out. And I start talking, he goes, whack, 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 whack. How many, how many wish you had a few words whacked down? Yeah. And so Jesus is trying to say, every word you speak against me, I'll forgive. And every word you speak against the Father, he'll forgive. And every word you speak against each other will be forgiven. But remember, if you speak idle words and you don't speak positive things about who Jesus Christ is and what he did for your life, you're going to give an account for it. Amen? Hello? I'm preaching better than you're responding. See, what you say matters. And I, and I want everybody in this room to understand, according to Ephesians 4.25 and Ephesians 5.4, what grieves the Holy Ghost by our tongue is things like lying, corrupt communication, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamoring, evil speaking, foolish talking, and jesting. There are so many things that God says that does not edify each other, does not edify your life. And so I'm not telling you you've got to walk around with duct tape on your mouth. I'm telling you you've got to walk around with Jesus on your heart. Amen? You've got to walk around with prayer, the, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, a prayer life, a love life. A wonderful life with God. You need to be covered in the grace of God because what you say matters. Amen. So if what I say matters, then I want to be very careful to always be kind and courteous and loving to each other 
and to be a person that will edify and glorify Jesus Christ. I don't want to put myself down, and I don't want to put you down. Now, sin will put us down. You know, it's not, it's not the preaching of God's Word that's the problem. Sin is our problem. Sin will put us down. But don't you know, our God will pick us up. Amen? Pick us up. Someone said, be soft and sweet with your words. You never know when you're going to have to eat them. Amen. Hello. You say, well, how does someone eat words if they're not soft and gentle and kind? How is it that someone has to eat words? You say, how, how could that possibly, how could that possibly uh, figure into what you're saying? Be careful what you say lest you have to eat them. Well, when you say something, someone confronts you later and says, didn't you say this? That's when you're eating your words. Amen. And you're eating them through your ears. Someone will bring out something you've said that wasn't edifying, and when they bring it to your attention, you're eating your words. Amen. You know, I'm preaching verse by verse through the Bible, and there's just things you can't avoid. Hear me? There's just things you can't avoid. See, if preachers are just preaching their, their sugar sticks and, and preaching about Come, you sweetheart, the storms are so hard. Come. Then we got to understand that, that um, the, the, what we say and what we believe about Jesus Christ matters. What we say about Jesus matters. And that's what Jesus Christ is trying to say to those Pharisees. What you say about me matters. And I want you to know what you say about Jesus matters. Every one of us needs to try every day of our life, or at least every week of our life, to confess Jesus before someone else. We need to exalt him, not just in church, but at home. We need to exalt Jesus, not just in, at home, but in the workplace. You say, well, I might get fired, then fire on. Don't worry about it. I'm not telling you to be lazy and go around preaching to everybody at work and, and end up getting fired. You ought to be fired if you're that way. But if someone asks you, why are you smiling like you're smiling? Tell them. So just, why are you so nice? Tell them. If they ask you, why are you so mean? Tell them. You need to get closer to God. Hello. Now, there's people, there's people like Tyler that calls them up on the phone and they feel his ear. Right? Because they're unhappy. Tyler is a public relation guy. And when they call Tyler up at work and someone's dissatisfied, Tyler says, I know, we'll get that fixed. Not a problem. We'll take care of that. You know, you're right. We'll take care of it. <laughs> Every idle word. Everything you say. Amen? When I worked at the APCO gas station, Campbell Oil Company, years ago as a young teenager, my, my boss would always tell me, now, son, the customer is not always right. Clifford Campbell used to tell me that. The customer is not always right. And, and there's been a few times when they would come into the gas station. You know, we had the little bell, ding, ding, and I had to run out there and you want, you want regular or ethyl gasoline? Well, I'll take a dollar's worth of ethyl. And while you're done, put a two dollars worth of regular, leaded regular. Three dollars ought to fill the tank. They'd say, check my oil and check all my tires. Wash my windshield. And there were so many times I wanted to say, you're not always right. They don't do that today. You're on your own, you pull in the come and go. You're on your own, pull in the cases. You're on your own, you pull in. And if you don't know how to stick that nozzle in the gas tank, you're on your own. Amen? Raise the lid, 
Check the oil. I dated a girl years ago, long before I ever met Judy, and um, it was just one of them teenage puppy things, you know. We never, nothing serious, nothing went on, but, you know, we just, and she drove her car, and she finally drove it until the motor literally locked up on the highway. The motor just locked up. And her dad had it towed in, and he raised the hood, and he pulled out the dipstick, and it was dry as a bone. He, uh, he took the intake off, the valve covers off. He went out, and it was just baked. I mean, the motor was just locked up, just burned up. And he says to his daughter, didn't you ever check the oil in this thing? She said, well, Daddy, I, I figured you would. Was well, it, wasn't there ever a light to come on your dash? She said, yeah. And he said, well, why didn't you tell me? She said, oh, I didn't want to bother you. She said, well, did you just let the light glow in your face all the time? She said, no, I put black electrical tape over it. <laughs> because she thought if she couldn't see the problem, it wasn't there. Amen? Trust me. She was just a little dingy. I got rid of her in a hurry. Because I was afraid my motor would lock up. And if you're watching on television, just leave me alone. The story is told of a man who went to the top of the mountains. And when he got to the top of the mountains, there came the first snow of the season. And as he's getting ready to go down, there's this rattlesnake. The rattlesnake is so stiff and cold. The rattlesnake says to the hiker, the mountain climber, would you take me down to the bottom of the mountain? I'm so cold. And the Mountain climber said, are you crazy? You're a rattlesnake. He said, oh, I won't bother you. I won't hurt you at all if you'll just give me a ride to the bottom of the hill. And so the old mountain climber stuck the rattlesnake in his pocket, began to make his way down, and that old rattlesnake began to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And finally, as the Mountain climber gets almost to the valley floor. It's pretty warm. And the old rattlesnake sticks his head out the pocket, strikes him, and pumps venomous poison into the mountain climber. The mountain climber said, I trusted you. I, I brought you down from the mountain to a place of warmth. I trusted you. And the rattlesnake said, you knew what I was when you picked me up. And I want everybody in this room to know that you might make excuses about a friend, excuses about a boyfriend, a girlfriend. You might make excuses about something in your life, but you know what it is. And you know, in the end, it's not going to work out. Amen? Hello? Woo! Glory to God. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and so, Jesus Christ says, what you say about me matters. See, the Pharisee said, you're casting out devils by the Holy Ghost that's in you is the devil, the spirit of the devil. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're blaspheming. You, he didn't say you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost, but he talked about how it would result in that. So you can say bad things about me, and it'll be forgiven. You can say bad things about the Father, it'll be forgiven. But if you say bad things and blaspheme the Holy Ghost and continue to live a life of rejection toward me, you'll die in your sin, and you'll go to hell because there's no forgiveness once you die in your sin. And people say no to the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And so Jesus Christ is telling them it matters what you say about me. 
And how many know it does matter what we say about Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ said in verse 38 through 42, he said, as Jonah, he said, they, they, in verse 38, the Pharisees said, we want to see a sign. Show us a miracle. I mean, no, Jesus could have showed them a thousand signs, a hundred thousand miracles. It wouldn't have mattered because their hearts was evil. But Jesus Christ said, I'm going to give you one sign. And he said, verse 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And Jesus Christ is saying, the people in Nineveh rose up, and they'll rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Verse 42, and the queen of the south, that's Sheba, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus Christ is telling them, I'm greater than Jonah. The sign I'm going to give you is I'm going to die and raise again from the grave. As Jonah was swallowed up by a whale, I'll be swallowed up by death. I'll die on the cross of Calvary. I'll shed my blood for, for every sin man, every sin a man and woman. I'll give my life a ransom. I'll, I'll, I'll redeem every soul that will come my way. I'll go to the tomb. I'll go to the heart of the earth. I'll be buried in the heart of the earth. I'll be there for three days and three nights, exactly the time that Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. And he said, at the end, as Jonah was vomited, spit up on the shores of Nineveh, preached the word, and the Nineveh repented of their sin. He said, I'll come up out of, the, out of the graveyard. I'll die. I'll be put in a tomb. I'll get up. I'll come up out of the grave. That's the sign you're going to see, and you better watch it. You better understand that what you say and believe about me matters. He says, as the Queen of Sheba came from a long journey, the queen of the south. And she came to Solomon to hear his wisdom. And Jesus Christ said, a greater than Solomon is here. I brought you greater wisdom. I brought you greater hope. I love reading about Solomon. But he didn't know a thing about women. He had plenty of them. But he didn't know a thing about women. He had 700 wives and 300 cucumber vines. <laughs> Combines. Excuse me. Concubines. <laughs> Solomon must have been the most miserable man on the planet. You can read Ecclesiastes and tell that. He wanted to die. Amen. Now, I don't know how they did laundry back then. Don't know what they dressed like back then. Could you imagine Solomon walking out in the palace courtyard and he gets tangled up in 1,000 pantyhoses hanging on the clothesline? That's enough to want to die. Solomon was wise, but he was also stupid. And Jesus Christ said, I am a greater than Jonah and I'm greater than Solomon. And what you believe and what you say about me matters. Hello? What you say about me matters. Listen to me. Jesus Christ said in our previous studies, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Jesus Christ went on to say in Luke 12, 8 and 9, also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall I 
him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God in heaven. But he that denies me before men, I will deny him before the angels of God in heaven. He that denies me before men, him I will deny before my Father is in heaven. He said, whosoever, whosoever, if you'll confess me before men, confess that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Confess that you're a sinner and my blood washes you clean. Confess that you needed a Savior. Confess that I am the Redeemer. Confess that I came to die for your sin. Confess to others that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Confess to others you believe God's Word. You believe the Word of Jesus Christ. You believe that Jesus is the true Messiah. Confess Jesus Christ to others and tell others in this God-forsaken planet Tell others that Jesus Christ did not forsake us. He died, rose again from the grave. He lives and he's your Savior. It matters what you say about Jesus. It matters that you tell men and women and confess Jesus before them. Because on that day you stand before God... Jesus will say, this one's mine. This one's mine. This one's mine. This one's the one that caught them four people in the elevator and told them all about me, about Jesus. He's mine. And boy, did they leave that elevator in a hurry. I almost said to a crowd when I was talking to them about Jesus, they, the, the elevator started to open. They, they were trying to go through before the doors got all the way open. And I got to thinking, if I kept on preaching, they might have just stepped out in the walls and just stepped to the door and down they go. And you know, Jesus is the great divider. He really is. Jesus is the great divider. He's the one that puts a sword between us and our family. Jesus is the great divider. We like to think Jesus is bringing peace. No, he brought peace to my heart. He brings peace to your heart. But he doesn't bring peace to your family because once you get born again, your family's got a problem with that sometimes. Amen? I remember one time my brother said to me, James, brother, I'm sure glad you got saved, but I wish you'd leave me alone when we're in the boat alone. See, we need to confess Jesus to others. Amen? No, I don't mean we don't, I mean, we, we're not supposed to run them down and give them an evangelistic mug, and that's not what I'm saying. But we do need to be vocal about our love for Jesus. Amen? In fact, let me tell you, friend, we are approaching a time. We are approaching a time that you will be forced to acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you will be intimidated and not do so. That's coming. It's already happened. It's happened in my life, someday, and I've never had to be forced to do it, but I do realize that if a person's not walking with the Lord and real strong with the Lord, they'll, they'll say, well, do you go to church? Yeah. Why do you go to church? Well, I just like the music. The preacher's, he's wonderful. Well, I just like to go to church. Why else do you like to go to church? Well, you know, to have good coffee. Why do, you, why do you go to church? Why do you go to church all day? See, and, and you start saying all these things. Why don't you just open your mouth and tell them, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He died for my sins, rose again from the grave, and one day he's coming back for me. It matters what you say about Jesus Christ. It matters that you say that Jesus is more than a teacher. He's more than a prophet. He's more than just a a man of God. Jesus is more than just a lamb who died on the cross. Jesus is God. 
the Son of God, and that he went to the grave and rose again from the grave after he, after he had suffered on the cross and shed his blood for our sins, he went to the tomb, and three days and three nights later, he arose again from the grave. It matters what you believe about Jesus. It matters what you say about Jesus Christ. And so every week we ought to try somewhere, some way, to discipline ourselves at least every week to tell someone something good about Jesus Christ and to how special he is in our life. Because the more you do that, the more confidence you'll have. And then when you do get to heaven, he'll confess you, Jesus will, to his Father, to our Father. And he'll confess us before the angels. Isn't that good? So what we say about Jesus is important. It does matter what we say about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, I'm greater than Solomon. I'm greater than Jonah. I'll spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That isn't just the tomb that is the heart of the earth. He rose again from the dead, and today he's coming back soon. Amen. The controversy over in the Middle East. Well, you know, Israel doesn't belong on the land because Israel's squatting on the land. She's just occupying the land. Trust me. Trust me. Muslim, Islamism. Palestine, all that stuff. David ruled on the throne in the city of Jerusalem 1,500 years before Muhammad was even born. I heard on a news report where these guys were complaining about Israel being the little Satan and the U.S. being the great Satan. That's what they believed, the, the Islamic terrorists and Hezbollah and uh, Hamas and all them, they believe that. And by the way, get ready. They will have strikes against the U.S. It will happen. I don't know when, but it will happen. Our borders have been wide open too long. We have sl sleeper cells all over this nation, and we will be looking at another 911, another 911. We will be looking at some more terrorism. It's coming. I said, it's coming because we didn't protect our border. It's coming. You know, Israel's going through everything they've went through. Let me say this. The Hamas says that the Jews are the Saturday people and the Christians are the Sunday people. That's what they say. Well, what are they're the Saturday people or the Sunday people? I'd rather them say they're the Jesus people. Amen? Now, the Jews are not the Jesus people. They're God's people. But the church is Jesus people. Amen? You can't be part of the church if you're not Jesus people. You're not of the church if you're not a Jesus person. Because Jesus is the one that builds his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Someone said, well, what's going to happen with America? And I'll deal with this tonight some, but I'll just give you a little taste. What's going to happen to America? Did you know that America doesn't need a missile or a, a nuclear weapon dropped on us to be destroyed? We don't need a missile. We don't need a nuclear bomb dropped on us to be destroyed. All we need to be destroyed is our economy to totally collapse, and we're done. We're done. I'm glad I'm trusted in Jesus because the economy is really, really good in heaven. Jesus has a real good economy. I'm not going to starve to death. He can, he can, he can, he can uh, break the five loaves and the two fish and feed thousands and thousands of people. Amen? I mean, I can walk out in the wilderness uh, 
if God wanted to and, and look up into the clouds and say, Jesus, I'm hungry and thirsty, and, and Jesus just drop a big old roll of bread right in my arms and, and squirt some water down on me, and I'll have bread and water. He could do that. But what he'd rather you do is trust him, love him, be prepared. I don't know what's going to happen to Israel. I don't know what's transpiring, but I'll say this, be ready. Be ready. So I don't believe in pre-trib rapture. Be ready. I believe in post-trib rapture. Be ready. I believe we're going to go through all the tribulation. Be ready. I'm just telling you, be ready. Be ready. Get ready. Replant your tree. Speak your confession in Christ. Love the Lord. Fill your mind with good things. Fill your heart with good things. Fill your ears with good things. Trust God. Get rooted in the things of God. Get ready because Jesus could split the eastern sky today. And if he doesn't split the eastern sky, he may come above the clouds in the sky and call us home. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. You know what Jesus Christ said about when the Tower of Siloam fell and when there's so many Jewish people that were butchered back in before his day? You know what Jesus' response to them was? His response was, get ready. Be ready. When you hear wars and rumors of war, when you see these things begin to take place, lift up your eyes, your redemption draws nigh. Be ready. Be ready. Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to, I want you to say with me as Josh comes and brings the song, I want you to say with me, I believe that Jesus Christ, say it out loud, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for my sins, and he rose again from the grave. He's my Lord and my God. And one day he's returning from me. I believe that he is my Savior, my Lord, my Master forever. And I'll confess him before others till the day I die or go home. Stand with me.